Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, we'll be continuing our study of verses 13 to 17. Actually, we'll be picking up at the end of verse 14 and continuing to verse 17 as we see what the Word of God has to say about honoring Christ. But before we do that, we will once again go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word, which is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, we thank you for your living and abiding Word. We thank you that it is the sole infallible rule of faith for our lives. And we ask, Father that we as your sheep have eyes that see your word and ears that hear your word and a heart and a mind that store your word and act upon it. Just as we've studied in our catechism, Lord, help us to live out your word and honor Christ in the doing of it. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Read with me 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. We remember last week we were talking about how upside down it is because of God's graciousness to be punished for doing good. We, we talked about how it, you can see God's grace and mercy and his hand holding back evil in the fact that in most modern societies, the last person who's going to be put in jail, the last person who's going to be punished is the law-abiding citizen. The citizen that's out there trying to establish an orphanage. The citizen who's out there doing good. But we also realize that children of darkness, children of Satan, hate the truth of God's word. And so while it is, in a certain sense, a little upside down, and there's that rhetorical question in verse 13, who in their right mind would harm you if you're zealous for doing what is good? The answer, obviously, is no one in their right mind. And that tells us a lot about the state of mind and the perversion to which people fall who punish those who do good. We think of how our brothers and sisters in China stated several decades ago to the communist leader of the time, we will be the perfect law-abiding citizens. We will not steal. We will not speed. We will not break the laws of the land. So long as we are able to worship God. And the answer from the communist leader was, you will worship me or you will die. And has been the case ever since. We know the same was the case with Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego. King, you've crossed the line. This is where we cannot obey. So we have biblical examples, we have historical examples of this reality. When the world turns against those that are doing what is good in the sight of God. And we talked about zealots. Those people that are willing to go and die, as the Maccabees were, for obedience to God. 
and how it is that we as Christians should be filled with a desire to continuously strive for obedience. And how Peter was saying, well, we already know that it's crazy for leaders and magistrates to punish those that are doing good. But Nero is our king and he's already doing that. So, even if you should suffer, Peter says in verse 14, for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. You are the blessed. You are blessed by virtue of the fact that you are a son or daughter of God redeemed through Jesus Christ. And you will be blessed because eternally you have an eternal inheritance. You have a home. God is good and faithful. And so with these thoughts in mind, Peter says, have no fear of them, nor be troubled. And we've talked over the last several weeks as we've been going verse by verse through 1 Peter about what godly fear should be. The scriptures at large are filled with God's encouragement to believers to not fear the world because of him. To not fear based on the knowledge of who God is and on the relationship that we have with Him as our Savior and our God. God says, do not be afraid because I am your God. Moses, for example, if we go to the Old Testament, Moses speaking before his death to the people of Israel called on the nation not to fear the pagans. Not to fear this giant number of people and their armies. Don't fear those that can kill you because God would lead them to dispossess the people as he would give them the promised land. And the verse, which is oftentimes taken way out of context, is be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord, your God, who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. I mean, it's such a common verse. We almost have it memorized, right? It's plastered all over the place. But we have oftentimes forgotten that this verse has a context. And that context is fear not. Don't fear the world. Do not be afraid of them, or as Peter just said, have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Don't let what the world can do to you bother you. Don't let what the world can do move you. Don't let the fact that the world can throw you in prison, the fact that in other parts of the world they'll decapitate you for being a Christian, move how you glorify God. And what is the encouragement for the Christian? Don't be afraid. Why? Because God is with you. In Deuteronomy, for the Lord is, Lord your God goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. And Christ said the same words to the disciples. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. We have the same promise resonating to the people of God in the whole of Scripture. Don't be afraid of the world. God is with you right here, right now. While you're in prison, God is there with you. While you're suffering difficulties for doing what God has commanded you to do, God himself is with you. Abide in me and I will abide in you, said Jesus. Later on, the Lord spoke to Joshua, encouraging him in Joshua 1, 6 to 9, saying, Be strong. And courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For when you will make your way prosperous, and then, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. 
and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Three times in this section of scripture, the encouragement is be strong, be courageous, be strong, be very courageous, be strong and be courageous. Do not be frightened because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go and sandwiched in between and in the midst of these three, be strong and be courageous is how you're going to be strong and be courageous. Meditating on the law of the Lord day and night, not letting what God has commanded move away from your mind and your heart. We sing it, and it's in the scriptures, the Lord is my strength and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is my rock and my fortress. Of whom shall I be afraid? We sing it a lot in the Spanish, actually. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. God is our strength. God is our all in all. He is the one that has saved us. He is the one that has redeemed us. He is our protector. He is our faithful great shepherd. And over and over and over again, throughout the whole of scriptures, the resounding testimony is be strong in Christ. Be courageous through Christ. Do not be afraid of the world, but abide in the word of God. In a sense, kind of touching on what we have been in, in Wednesday for a little bit, but also going back to when we were in Isaiah, God speaking through Isaiah to the exiles that were going to be in Babylon 150 years before it happened, wrote this in Isaiah 41, 8 through 10. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took, from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corner saying to you you are my servant I have chosen you and not cast you off fear not for I am with you be not dismayed for I am your God I will strengthen you I will help you I will uphold you with my righteous right hand it's all God. It's always been all God. The one who called us, the one who elected us, the one who saved us, the one who has chosen us to be his servants, his royal priests, says unto us, hey, I have chosen you and I have not cast you off. Because what's the first thing you think or can think when you're in serious trouble, when you're in prison and you've just gotten beaten for being a faithful Christian? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yet the testimony of Scripture is, I have not cast you off. I have not left you. I have not abandoned you. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. Don't let yourself fall into desperation. Why? For I am your God. And then comes the greatest words of encouragement. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with what? My righteous right hand. And again, we remember that right hand is a phrase used in the Old Testament to mean by my power. So God is saying, I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you by my omnipotence in the midst of all your troubles. Isaiah 43, verse 1, But now says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name and you are mine. So when things get tough, our mind should always run to the scriptures, run to God, go to him and always reminding ourselves, I am a son of God. God has redeemed me. He has called me. He has said unto me, you are mine. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be afraid. And that's what we're getting into next. David declared this truth. Who do we fear? God. And the fear we have is a familial fear. In Psalm 23, verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
So even if I'm walking in the midst of destruction, even if I'm walking in the midst of all kinds of troubles, I won't fear it. I will fear no evil. I won't fear the things of this world and the countless dead around me. Why? Because you are with me, God, and you are with me both in your discipline and in your leading with your rod and with your staff. And that is a comfort to me. Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And again, Psalm 34, 4. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. There is absolutely nothing wrong when in the middle of the problems going to God and saying Lord I am scared I am terrified I'm a human being and the fact that I could very well be killed tomorrow in this prison terrifies me be my strength embolden me Lord God help me to be faithful unto the end I've said it many many times I find that I've learned from Peter I'm not going to say, even unto death, Lord, I'll be faithful no matter what. I, I don't want for the Lord to place me in the situation where I am proven wrong. Rather, because I've learned from Peter, I say, Lord, if ever the point in time comes when you have called me to go through suffering for your name's sake, please strengthen me. Help me to faithfully represent you in those situations. This is the do not be afraid. This is what Peter is talking about when he says at the end of verse 14, have no fear of them. Don't fear the world. Don't be troubled by what can happen. And then he continues in verse 15 saying, you are not to be fearful, but rather in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Honor Christ the Lord. Do not be afraid. Honor Christ. Do not be afraid. Trust and believe in God your Father. Do not be afraid, but rather focus every conceivable effort of your mind and heart in the act of honoring Christ the Lord as holy. See Him as holy. We've talked over the last several months, almost a year now, over the fact that Christ should be our treasure. He should be that pearl of great price. And as such, in times of difficulty, He is more valuable to us than anything. But the focus here is on honoring Christ, who is our Lord, Christ the Lord, as holy. Your hearts should be inclined to reverence Christ as holy, knowing The testimony of this truth is everywhere in Scripture. It was a pre-incarnate Christ before whom Isaiah stood hearing the seraphim proclaim that he is holy, holy, holy. Christ encouraged the disciples to reverence God in the Lord's Prayer by saying, Hallowed be thy name. Sanctified, reverenced acknowledged as holy. That's what we mean when we're saying that we are to honor Christ the Lord as holy in our hearts. We meditate on that. He is holy. He is the example. And that's what we're going to get to later on. And we've gotten to over and over again. Christ is the example. And because Christ is our example, we move our hearts into thinking God, holy My Christ is holy. And he has said, you are to be holy as I am holy. My Christ is holy and I hold him as such. You acknowledge as holy. Sanctify him as holy in your heart. You acknowledge as holy the name of our God whose kingdom and will we desire to be made manifest on earth as it is in heaven. So when we're in difficult situations, we remember this, that our God is holy, that he has called us to be holy, that he has called us to reverence him as holy to the very uttermost of our being, 
to our hearts and that the proclamation of that starts with us. We are the representatives. We stop and we think in Isaiah 8, 13, but the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. These things are tied. Just as love and obedience are inextricably bound together, so are reverence and filial fear. These things are always together. Love and obedience. Love and obeying the Lord. Well, so are reverencing or counting God as holy and fearing God. We count God as holy, therefore He is the one whom we reverence. He is the one whom we fear. We sanctify Him and herald Him as our Lord and Savior. And that comes with action. All of these things are bound together. And when we have Jesus Christ as holy in our hearts, that reality goes hand in hand with fearing Him rather than men. It's that fear, the filial, familial fear, fear of disappointing Him, fear of failing Him, fear of transgressing against Him, that goes hand in hand with the knowledge that the one we love and fear is our Lord and Protector, our Savior and Redeemer, our Brother and our King. And we don't want to disappoint Him. Think, think for a moment of how many times your sins and transgressions against God have honestly brought you before Him, I'm not saying in front of everyone, before Him to tears, where there is a, a sincere recognition of that. There is a move, a stirring of your affections. And what we are called to do is to reverence Him as holy. We're in a difficult situation. We have been called to suffer for righteousness' sake. We are called to not fear. And why don't we fear? Because we fear God rather than men. Our spiritual worship should involve a cultivating within us a reverential disposition, a sanctifying and hallowing of Jesus Christ, the Lord, within our hearts. Why? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. These are biblical truths that you can connect the dots directly to here. If Christ is your supreme treasure, if Christ is your all in all, if, as we've already seen from the Old Testament passages, you are storing up godly truths that herald and show the gloriousness of Christ, then because He is your treasure, out of the abundance of that hallowing and reverencing of Christ in your heart, honoring Christ as Lord, the fruit that will come out of your mouth is that which glorifies God. I cannot betray my Lord. That was a proclamation of a, one of the most prominent martyrs in the first century. He said, the Lord has been faithful to me for 86 years. How can I be unfaithful to him now? This is the meditation. This is a testimony of scripture. What you treasure in your heart should be God. And what pleases God and the law of God, the Son of God, the things of God. Those who reverence and honor Christ in their heart as holy and store the word of God in their heart so as not to sin against Him are those who truly own their faith. We've lost the sense and the definition and the meaning behind honor in, modern, in the modern world at large. We, we hear about it and we read about it in Shakespearean literature. Men standing up for the honor of a woman or fighting for the honor of this or fighting for the honor of a king in defense of the honor of our Lord we are called 
to be firm, to stand faithful. You have to own it. It has to be your own. Genuinely yours. Living it out as holy priests. It is these Christians who are going to hallow Christ with genuine reverence. It's demonstrated in every action. They're eating and drinking to the glory of God. How they react to problems and persecutions. How they respond when questioned as to why they are the way they are and why they believe what they believe. And this is why Peter says, those who hold Christ as holy in their hearts hearts must always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Do you see the connection between honoring Christ in your heart and defending Christ in word when asked? It's coming to the defense of Jesus Christ verbally. Before we get into how we are to be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, there is a question or a couple of questions that are relevant that you should answer. Can you defend what you believe and why you believe it? That's the first one. Yes or no. Are you able, you personally, to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you? That's a second question. Third, is your answer one based upon an ownership of your faith? Or is it an echo or a verbal regurgitation of what a pastor or a parent or a friend of yours who is known to be knowledgeable in the word has said? What I mean by that is, is the answer that you provide something you genuinely and wholeheartedly believe in? Or are you simply parroting what someone else has said that you should believe? When someone asks you, why do you believe in Jesus Christ? Is it your answer from your study of the scriptures, from your hiding of God's word in your heart? Or is it merely what you've heard people say for forever? Are you responding in Christianese or are you genuinely owning that faith? It's important because the word that Peter uses for defense is the word apologia, from where we get, get the word for apologetics. Apologetics at their core are a defense of the faith. Are you prepared and equipped with your own knowledge to defend your faith-driven actions? Your faith-filled and conducted life? Why do you say amen after a hymn? Why don't you cuss? Why are you a law-abiding citizen? Why do you wear Christian t-shirts all the time? Are you a capitalist? Why do you do what you do? Why do you believe what you believe? And do you own it? Is your answer, well, because my great-grandfather and his father and his father for generations have been Christians, so so am I. Or are you answering, as Peter has already said, once I was not a people, but now I am. Once I had no mercy, but now I have mercy. R.C. Sproul comments saying, if your neighbor says, I notice that you're a Christian, what is it that you believe? Are you ready to explain not only what you believe, but why you believe it? Some Christians tell those who inquire that we simply take a leap of faith with no bother about the credibility or the rational character of the truth claims of the Bible. But that response goes against the teaching of this text. The only leap of faith we are to take is out of the darkness and into the light. 
When we become Christians, we do not leave our mind in the parking lot. We are called to think according to the Word of God, to seek the mind of Christ and an understanding of the things set forth in sacred scripture. The Bible is a big book. And every bit of it, I believe, has been inspired by God the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, the author of this book is God. He gave it to us to be understood, and we cannot understand it if we close our mind to the careful study of it. And we've already seen from the Old Testament, how is it sandwiched in between, do not be afraid, that we are equipping ourselves not to be afraid. We invest our time in the Word of God and store the Word of God within our hearts and live out its truths in thought and word and deed. And this reality will inevitably come to irritate and agitate and incite those that are walking in darkness as we walk as salt and light in this world. If someone says, how absurd is it that you genuinely believe in a six-day creation? You really think that some great big grandpa in the sky said, let there be, and just by his words alone, everything that you see around you really came to be that way? Now you can respond one of two ways. (laughs) You can answer the fool according to his folly and say, my friend, you believe that an accident and an explosion made all of these incredible things around you that you see. You are a byproduct of stardust and fizzing particles with no rational reason for your existence. Or you can do what those that don't own their faith do and say, well, that's just, that's just what I believe. The scriptures do not leave that as a sufficient answer. It's not. And, and I want you to note that this doesn't say pastors. Deacons, every Christian, because we've just recently been in the area where Peter is talking about what all of the church is to do. Every single Christian has as a command preparing yourself to properly defend the faith. When the situation comes around and they ask us why we believe what we do, why we believe what we believe, why we act the way we do, why we speak as we speak. Our response, according to the scriptures, is an outpouring of the scriptures stored within our hearts and treasured within us. A defense of the holiness of God and His commands and of our relationship with Him as sons and daughters through the sacrifice of Christ our Lord. But we don't just verbally slam Scripture in people's faces or find just the right verse to cause anger from the person that we are defending God's honor from when they ask us for a reason for our faith. Peter says that the way in which we respond is supposed to be with gentleness and respect. We don't go, well, (laughs) I've got an answer for you. The Word of God says, I'm supposed to answer a fool like you according to your folly. So listen here, fool. You're dumber than a bag of rocks. Can't you see that everything in creation, according to Romans, testifies that there is a God? No. It's not just what you say, but how you say it. We are to respond when defending our faith, when defending what our hope is. We sing it, right? Our hope is built on nothing less than what? Jesus, blood, and righteousness. One of these days, y'all are going to have these hymns so deeply ingrained in your mind that when I just start saying one of them, you'll be able to complete them. And then you'll understand what all of the Christians at the cross Understood when Christ said, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because they had their hymnal memorized. What is your hope? 
Why are you wasting your life? Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, when you could be doing other things. Why are you stopping yourself from enjoying all of the dainties of this world? Are you really going to go to jail for saying that men are men and women are women? Why can't you just let live? Live and let live. Keep your faith to yourself. Why? Why can't you do that? Why do you do this? The, the, these are the things. And our response is, because I have been redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. What's the hymn say? Redeemed. How? I love to shut my mouth about it and not tell anyone about it. No. Redeemed. How? I love to proclaim it. His child and forever I am. That this is it. We, we, we saw it all the way back in our first catechism question. We exist to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And that is here and now. We enjoy Him in this life and we'll enjoy Him forever. And the way we enjoy that is by honoring Christ in our hearts. He is holy. He is holy. And as ones who are intimately familiar with the one true and living God, the holy God, we say, man, how can I keep from speaking His truth? Pastor Aaron uses the example of Brother Paul Washer about the burning building. No one in their right minds, if this building was on fire, is going to sit there and say, ah, what a nice day. I'm so glad the heater's been turned up. I'm just going to make my way to the exit now. I'm not going to tell anyone about it. No, of course not. You're going to say, the building's on fire, man. Get out. Run, grab everyone that you can and head out in as orderly a fashion as you can towards the nearest exit. You see it. You see the danger. And you must say something about it. It's remarkable if you think about it that the same people that went bonkers upside down crazy over COVID-19 cannot reconcile in their minds that we have a significantly greater pandemic that we herald if you die without having truly and sincerely come to faith in Jesus Christ you will eternally burn in hell that's so much more than any COVID-19 that's so much more than any illness in this world this is eternal and we are called to represent that we were called to represent it, not just with gentleness and with respect, but with a good conscience, as verse 16 says. Having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. With all the recognition that we are speaking with an image bearer, we speak as an ambassador and a holy priest. We speak with gentleness, with respect, with a good conscience. We respond with gentleness and with respect because we have nothing, nothing in and of ourselves that brought about our salvation. As Peter's already said, we are those who were once not a people and didn't have mercy, but now are a people and have received mercy. We are beggars telling other beggars where to find bread. We are those who, when defending our faith, do so with the reality that without God's wondrous and gloriously freely given grace, we would be the ones reviling and inquiring. We would be the ones with spittle, in our mouths, hating the very thought of Christians speaking truth. This is what allows us to answer in a completely countercultural way. We respond this way with gentleness and with respect, with a clean and good conscience. And this is the type of defense that shames our detractors. They want to rile you up, they want to get a reaction. 
This is something so elementary that it's told to children going into schools. Maybe not so much nowadays, but one of those old school sayings, sticks and stones, right? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Not quite so much an application in modern day when words are, you know, violence. But it was a saying, hey, don't react. When they're calling you things, don't respond to it. That's that just going to show them that they've won. Don't react to what they say. It's, it's the same. They want to get a reaction. Give them a reaction. The godly reaction. You hate me, and I understand that you hate me, but I am going to continue praying for you, oh my jailer, that you come to faith in Jesus Christ, because I know where I'm going. I know where I will be for eternity. And from what I can see, and your hatred, and your vitriol, I know where you're going. And I desire that you be with me. That was Paul's proclamation. You've lost your mind. Would you have me be a Christian, Paul? I would. I would that all men would be like me, a Christian, except for these chains. I would that you be saved and redeemed, but not in prison like I am. We're free. We're free to serve. We're free to faithfully represent Christ. We're free from having to answer violence with violence, scorn with scorn, vitriol with vitriol, because we know where we're going. We know where we're going to be for eternity. John Calvin comments saying, For why did he before bid us, speaking of Peter, to be ready to defend the faith? Should anyone inquire from us a reason for it, except that it is our duty to vindicate the truth of God against those false suspicions which the ignorant entertain respecting it. But the defense of the tongue will avail but little except the life corresponds with it. He therefore says that they may be ashamed who blamed your good conversation in Christ and who speak evil against you as evildoers do, as though he said, if your adversaries have nothing to allege against you except that you follow Christ, they will at length be ashamed of their malicious wickedness, or at least your innocence will be sufficient to, conf sufficient to confute them. Man, why is that guy in solitary confinement? Because he won't shut up about Jesus. Why is that prisoner muzzled and bruised all over? Because he won't stop talking about how we need to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 17. For it is better. It is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Here's where the tires meet the road. We say we believe in Jesus Christ as Lord, as our King, as our Master. We say we believe that God is sovereign over every action and reaction in existence when we are suffering do we recognize that as truth if so then what we need to be cultivating in our lives is an attitude that corresponds with that truth I almost said of gratitude I really did I almost I almost did I technically did point being we need to speak the scriptures to ourselves. Well, God, you're sovereign. I know this. It's really hard for me right now. But your word says it is better to suffer for doing good if you will it. Obviously, you will it. Help me to be faithful. It is better in God's sight if he wills for you to suffer, for you to suffer as he has called you to suffer, than to suffer for doing evil. 
It's not just wait till I get out of here, prison guard. It is the testimony of Christians throughout generations. But man, is it hard? Man, is it difficult? But we have the example of heroes of the faith who responded with respect and gentleness, yet were firmly rooted in truth. Think of Daniel, Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego, of David, and the countless other heroes of the faith who responded with gentleness and respect, yet were reviled and hated and slandered and visited ill upon for doing what pleases God. Our actions with faithfulness in mind our actions in the midst of travails and sufferings for doing and speaking what is good and pleasing before our God are worth it. Scripture shows us how to suffer righteously. Think about it. The Word of God is so sufficient, so incredibly, profoundly specific and helpful that not only did the scriptures, as we've seen in Peter, already tell us how we interact with a worldly government, how we interact with a worldly boss, how we interact with a worldly spouse, but we're even told how to suffer in the way that pleases God the most. Better it is, says the word of God, the infallible and sufficient rule of faith, to suffer for doing what is good before God's eyes than to suffer for doing evil. We're taught how to live, we're taught how to worship, we're taught how to praise, we're taught how to be a holy priesthood, we're taught how to conform our lives to Jesus Christ, and the Word of God is even so good that we can look to it and see how we're supposed to suffer well. Well, I don't have it as bad as Job, and Job didn't turn against the Lord. At least in the modern American prison system, you get three squares and free medical health care, right? We, we learn how to suffer righteously. So we close with the words of Paul in Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And all of God's people said,